Pamela, thank you so much for joining me for this Q&A to talk about COVID-19 testing, telemedicine, and basically what's going on in the front lines. In your initial evaluation of a student or employee on that first call, they get the positive test result, you're calling them, and what are some of the things that you say to evaluate the patient over the phone? When I make my initial contact, the first thing I ask about is how they're feeling. And right away, I'll know how the conversation is going to go based on the, when they tell me how they're feeling. So if they're asymptomatic, um, we proceed in talking about why that might be and measures they need to take moving forward. If they talk to me about some symptoms they're having, we talk about ways that they might manage it or reasons that those symptoms may or may not be COVID related. Also, we let them know that we're here for them and we're going to stay with them through the duration. In addition, it should be noticed that we never are a replacement for their primary care physician. And I encourage for them to reach out to their primary care immediately to let them know the situation and as well as taking care of other members of the family that may be now at risk for contracting the virus. And I guess that leads to my next question. At what point do you escalate that level of care that you think that they need to go and visit their PCP? Anytime an individual has a pre-existing condition that might put them at increased risk for some of the more catastrophic, for lack of a better word, outcomes with COVID, with risk for respiratory illness or anybody who's immunocompromised, we especially want to make sure that we have them reaching out to their primary care physician for anyone that has a pre-existing condition. As a pre-existing condition, along with a COVID diagnosis, can lead to more untoward outcomes. So we want to be right on top of that in all situations. And what kind of quarantine guidance do you give them, especially if they're living in a multi-generational household? Sure. That definitely changes the dynamics of you know self-isolation. So we talk about who do they live with? What type of physical layout do they have? Have they thought about where they would um, self-isolate? It's amazing the number of people who have already kind of figured out where, where they would put themselves if they needed to do so. But if they haven't done that, we talk about it. And we also explain the rationale because I think anytime somebody knows why they're doing something, they are 10 times more likely to follow through and do it that way. Also, when we are talking about that, we find out who else is in the household and who we might need to make sure that they're reaching out to their primary care for testing as soon as possible. That makes sense. And Pam, you've become an expert when it comes to reporting to the public health departments. And this is a really big question that we get. How do you report to both local and state health departments? So reporting of communicable diseases is completely regulated by each state and U.S. territory individually, although they fall under the guise of the CDC and the, the federal legislation. The ultimate rule on how they handle it is up to the state or territory. So depending on where a client uh, or a student is located, we look at the rules and regulations of each particular state or jurisdiction. And it is, everything is handled with complete confidentiality. We follow all the HIPAA guidelines. Everything is conveyed in a pure privacy protecting manner. And everything is done very timely and in accordance with state and local laws. Information is reported via encrypted facsimiles, encrypted email, electronic state uh, registries, where we and in-house physicians have access to electronically report some of our communicable diseases. And every day we're adding on new and faster reporting methods. So it's really an exciting time in communicable disease reporting. Yeah, definitely. You've become an expert at it. Have you seen anything different when it comes to the telehealth line with students compared to employees? Like, does, do, are there different questions that come up? Yes. Um, a lot of the students want to know, should they go home? Or they actually will tell me, I can't go home because someone at home has you know, X, Y, or Z problem and I can't go home. So I don't usually get that with um, a corporate type client. The students really are very receptive to any information that's being given them. And I think they're just so grateful to have the telehealth line that they can reach out and it's not like they're asking mom or dad, but they're actually reaching um, a healthcare source. We're available for them and we're following through with them 
until they are released to return to everything on campus. The corporate clients become interesting because a lot of times they have moved from one physical location to another and we need to monitor and track them and sometimes help them with uh, quarantine arrangements because they, they travel so heavily. And it becomes interesting, for example, places like Alaska, it's almost like you're traveling internationally with the travel restrictions and the airport regulations. So it, it gets very detailed and intricate, but it is some, it's a dynamic process that I'm happy to say in-house physicians is completely on top of, and we are in the forefront of disease reporting. Pam, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it and your hard work. You're on the front lines of the fight against COVID-19 and this pandemic. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much, John.